This week we're going to be fishing in South Florida in the Everglades. The Everglades has many different regions within it. The section we're going to focus on today is the area that's just to the west of Everglades City and Chuck Lusky, known as the 10,000 Islands. We're also going to venture a little bit east of Everglades City and Chuck Lusky into what most consider the true Everglades. It's a seven hour drive from where I live in North Florida to the Everglades, so I stopped along the way this time at the Peace River, launching just off of I-75 at the Navigator Public Boat Ramp. The Peace River has lots of natural areas to explore, and you never know what you might catch or what might catch you. Along my way back to the ramp, I passed by a casualty of one of our recent hurricanes. From the Peace River, it took me about an hour to arrive at my camping spot for the night at Collier Seminole State Park. The park has a boat ramp so you can explore the mangrove jungles of the Blackwater River and exhibits like this that highlight the dugout canoe, which was the main form of transportation through the mangrove jungles and the river of grass for early inhabitants like the Calusa and Seminole Indians. The next morning I got an early start to get out to the islands where I'd be spending the next five days. My first destination would be my campsite, which is on an island about an hour away from the boat ramp. This island has a wonderful view of the Gulf of Mexico. After setting up camp, I had some time for some late afternoon fishing. The eye of Hurricane Irma passed directly over this area, and I was amazed at the damage that the hurricane had done. If you look at the left bank of the creek that I'm entering now, you can see where all the vegetation was killed by the salt-laden hurricane force winds, while the bank on the right was on the lee side of the wind and did not experience that heavy salt spray that caused the apocalypse of death that was on the left. One pattern for catching fish that I learned very quickly is that the fish preferred the banks that had living vegetation. During the five days in the Everglades, I did not catch one fish off of the dead banks. Fishing the front side islands near the Gulf of Mexico proved to be a little bit slow. All I had to show for my afternoon of efforts was one small snook, and a tenacious lizard fish that, even though he wasn't hooked, held on to my bait all the way into the boat. The next morning, due to my lack of success of fishing the front side of the islands near the Gulf of Mexico, I decided to make the long run back to the mainland and to fish the backwaters of the islands there. This change in strategy and location made all the difference and kept me in fish for the rest of the week. The keys to success in fishing the backwaters was to find points, creeks, and passes that had a good current flow. Here I'm fighting a nice snook. They also used to be known as a soap fish. That was until people knew to take the skin off the fish because the skin would give it a soapy taste. But once that skin comes off, it's one of the best eating fish in the Everglades. I love catching snook because of their aerial antics and how hard they pull on the line, so I haven't kept one to eat in over 20 years. The great thing about fishing in the Everglades is you never know what you're going to catch. On any given cast, you could come up with a redfish, a trout, a snook, jack, or even a tarpon. This time it's a nice trout. Every day I try and get an early start 
and early is a relative term. For me that meant around 7.30, but my compromise was is that instead of eating breakfast on shore, I'd take it with me and enjoy it on the boat while I was taking in the view. Occasionally I'd run into other residents of the mangroves, like this raccoon that was enjoying a little blue crab for breakfast. Another welcome diversion would be an osprey in its nest as it ridiculed me for getting too close as I moved along the bank looking for fish. Fortunately, it didn't take too long to find the fish. This time it was a snook. The rod that I caught 95% of the fish on this trip on was on a six and a half foot fast action tip that was a light to medium action through the rest of the body. I had it uh, with a 2000 class pen reel with eight pound test and tied to the eight pound test was a 30 pound bite tippet. The lure that was catching all the fish was a 1 8 ounce chartreuse jig head fished with a white 3 inch paddle tail. One of my favorite fish to catch in the backcountry is a jack caravel and this one definitely took me on quite a sleigh ride. To catch this fish I had to constantly stay on the trolling motor to avoid broken off mangrove limbs in the water, oyster bars, and then also when he took me close to shore and tried to drag me underneath the mangrove roots, I had to pull him back away from that also. All things considered, I was having a ball. During this trip I caught over a dozen of these large jacks and I enjoyed every fight. The most memorable fish of the trip for me was this large snook that I've got on now. When I first hooked him I thought for sure it was another jack and I didn't know it was a snook until he made his first jump and he was so big that only his head came out of the water. The way that I hooked into him is I made a cast up through the pass that you see there in the frame and let the jig drift back through uh, the deep uh, cut between the two islands that you see. And when he took the bait he just stayed deep like a jack would do but then all of a sudden he decided to come up to the surface. Once he came to the surface, all I could do is hang on, try and gain line, and keep him out of the anchor or out of the prop in the back of the boat.
after the quick photo shoot it was back into the water so this one could grow a little bit for the next time I'm down in the Everglades. After that workout, both the snook and I deserved a little relaxation time. And the rocking of the boat and the view as I went to sleep was pretty nice. And on the way back to camp, I got to enjoy one of nature's other colorful treats. Once I got back to the island, my friends had decided to go out for an afternoon cruise. So not to miss out on the fun, I bummed a ride on my friend's panga and it was off to the races. And then it was time to head back to the island for dinner. The extent of my expertise in cooking outdoors is limited to boiling water to add to dehydrated food. Fortunately for me, there are several in the group that are excellent cooks. As a matter of fact, two of them are executive chefs, one at a well-known restaurant and the other one at a major resort. Well, it's time to eat. Thanks to all my subscribers for joining me on this trip. And if you're not a subscriber, please join now so you don't miss the next adventure.